Hello. Welcome to the Japan America Society of the State of Washington, JASSW OIST Joint Series Kickoff Learning about SDG Through Outdoor Activities. My name is Makiko Kaufland. I'm a board member and a chair of the events committee of the Japan America Society of the State of Washington. Japan America Society of the State of Washington is a nonprofit organization founded in 1923 with a mission to promote mutual understanding and friendship between the peoples of Japan and Washington State by providing a forum for the exchange of ideas and information. Today, we will learn about Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, from the presentation and a panel discussion with special speakers led by Mr. Kenji Ushimaru, a CEO of Infra Innovations, who has a lot of experience in energy and environmental science, international trade, and aerospace industries. I'm very excited to present this kickoff event for the top, a joint program with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation to the JASSW members. Now I'd like to introduce David Jane, President and CEO of the Oyster Foundation for a welcome remark for this event. David San Thank you, Makiko, for that kind introduction. Good evening, and thanks to the audience for joining us for this afternoon or this evening, if you're in the East Coast, uh, important webinar titled Learning About SDGs Through Outdoor Activities with two amazing speakers. I'm so pleased that the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation, in partnership with OIST in Okinawa, is embarking on a joint speaker series with the Japan America Society of Washington State. For those who don't know, OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, is an interdisciplinary and international graduate school in Okinawa, offering a five-year PhD program in the sciences. We opened our doors 10 years ago. The OIST Foundation is a U.S. nonprofit based in New York that supports scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. Washington State, as you know, is a location of innovation and with deep ties to Japan. The Japan America Society of Washington State has a long and distinguished history, and by embarking on this series together, we look forward to building a long-term partnership that can benefit Washington and Okinawa, OIST, and the Japan America Society of Washington State. Very excited for this kickoff event. Thank you so much. Welcome to the kickoff session of the Joint Japan America Society of the State of Washington and Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation. My name is Kenji Ushimaru, and it is my distinct honor to serve as the moderator for this event. The subtitle of the webinar is Learning About SDG Through Outdoor Activities. I'm sure the members of the audience already know or searched the meaning of SDG, but please allow me to mention what SDGs are and how they should be considered as a guiding principle in our everyday life. SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goals. In Japanese, it is called Jizoku Kano na Kaihatsu Mokyo. All United Nations member states adopted a set of SDGs in 2015. The UN adopted a set of 17 goals. Some examples are no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, and so on. Today, we have the honor of welcoming two distinguished speakers who will discuss their personal history, professional career, and their inspiration and outlook for the future, and relate their stories to the Sustainable Development Goals. After the presentations by the speakers, we have allocated approximately 20 minutes of question and answer session. The Q&A session will form a panel discussion and I will be moderating the questions from the audience. Please use the chat function of the webinar platform to ask questions and the event organizers from the Japan America Society will send the questions to me and I will be serving as your traffic director. The first speaker is Dr. Yuko Kagazu. 
Dr. Kakazu is an astronomer doing her research work on galaxy formation and evolution of the universe at the Subaru Telescope operated by the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan at the summit of Mauna Kea Mountain on the Big Island of Hawaii. She was born and raised in Okinawa. During her middle school time in Japan, she had a chance to participate in a space camp sponsored by NASA in Alabama and it inspired her to pursue a career related to space. After graduating from Okinawa Shogaku High School, she began her studies in the Graduate School of Science at Tohoku University. After graduating with a bachelor's degree from Tohoku, she received her master's degree and a PhD in astronomy at the University of Hawaii at uh, Manoa. She is the very first astronomer from Okinawa. She has held various research positions in astronomy in Paris, Pasadena, California, and Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Kakazu is also very passionate about science education, and she serves as education ambassador for the OIST Foundation. The second speaker is Ms. Sophia Dannenberg of the Boeing Company. Ms. Dannenberg was also born in Okinawa, where her father was stationed as a member of the United States Army. In her early childhood, her family moved between Japan and Chicago, and she graduated from Flossmoor High School in Chicago. Initially, Ms. Dannenberg studied applied math and chemistry at Harvard University. However, after traveling to Thailand, she switched to an undergraduate degree in environmental sciences and the public policy, where she saw the intricate relationship between the natural environment and the economy. She graduated magma cum laude and was one of the first five students to graduate from this program. Upon graduation, Ms. Dannenberg was Fulbright Fellow at Keio University in Tokyo, where she began first rock climb. In May 2006, she became the first African-American woman to climb to the summit of Mount Everest. She continues to be active in local and national politics and serves as a board member of Nature Bridge in the Washington State Park Commissioner appointed by Governor Jay Inslee. Now, I'd like to pass the baton to Dr. Kakazu, our first speaker. Uh, Kakazu-sensei, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ushimura-san, for a wonderful introduction. It is such an honor and pleasure for me to give a presentation today to this distinguished guest and members. Um, my name is Yuko Kakazu. I am based in Hawaii, uh, but I was born and raised in Okinawa. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So uh, before I talk about my uh, work, I would like to talk a little bit about myself. As Ushimura-san uh, kindly introduced to me, I was born and raised in Okinawa. I am the first, uh, indeed, astronomer from Okinawa. I work on top of Mauna Kea. You see the summit of Mauna Kea and beautiful Milky Way galaxy and also Kilauea volcano. I've been studying how galaxies form um, and evolve for the last 20 years. Um, galaxies evolution and formation is my uh, research interest and I particularly I am interested in baby galaxies. So I've been looking for babies in the universe. This is my workplace, the summit of Mauna Kea. Uh, it's very high. Uh, it's not as high. It's not as tall as Mount Everest, but uh, it is quite high. The elevation is 14,000 feet, and you see the Japanese Subaru telescope. This is the telescope that I work at. Even though we live in Hawaii, and Hawaii is such a tropical island, but in winter on top of Mauna Kea, we do get some snow. So this is a picture taken a few years ago on Mauna Kea. You see a tall snow wall. But even uh, in winter, we can swim uh, after, of course, not on top of Mauna Kea, but in our base uh, town, Hilo. Uh, we, I love to swim and I, Sometimes I get to swim with honu, sea turtle, and also tropical fish. So as an Okinawan, I love, love beach. I love swimming. So this is my one of my hobbies. 
Uh, education and outreach is my passion. I love teaching. I love talking to people, especially kids. So I often go to local schools. Um, in fact, in this morning, I just went to high school uh, to uh, give some assistance to students. And I also give public lectures to uh, to Japanese and also anyone from around the world. And how I got into astronomy? Well, I was actually in the beginning when I was in elementary school, I was not interested in science. <laughs> but when I entered middle school, one of my science teachers recommended me, well, us to check this Japanese science magazine called Newton. And fortunately, our school library had this Newton. So I started reading uh, this magazine. Well, at the time, I had no idea about science. So um, I was just looking at beautiful pictures of galaxies, nebula. And I love these buzzwords like Einstein's general relativity and black hole and string theory. So I was often in the library and reading this magazine. And one day when I was uh, checking Newton at the library, I found an advertisement of US Space Camp program. As you know, Space Camp program is one week workshop program for the youth and to basically get the basic training for astronaut. And so half jokingly, I asked my parents if I could go to the US and attend the space camp. Um, my parents are not scientists. <laughs> They're actually farmers. I, growing up in Okinawa, I had never seen scientists in my life. Um, but uh, to my surprise, they said yes. And here I am, 14 years old. Um, this, I'm sitting in the front row. And at the time, I did not speak any English. And so there were volunteer translators from University of Alabama. They are Japanese students and they helped us. And so by the end of this space camp program, I decided to become an astronomer. Well, I decided astronomer, not astronaut. Sometimes people ask me why not astronaut? Well, because at the time I did not like any PE. I did not like enjoy sports. I, I would often read books in the library. So I thought astronomer would be nice because I get to stay and just do some work um, indoors. So, so that was the beginning of my journey into astronomy. But there was a big problem. I actually was not good at math and science. Um, unlike Sophia Sun, our next speaker, I was actually not good at math. Um, so I had to study because astronomy is based on physics and math. You need to study physics. So in fact, my major in university at university was physics. Um, so I studied, but I still couldn't get to my top choice university. I took, I even took a gap year after graduating from high school. I uh, still couldn't go. So I went to my second choice to university, but I was quite lucky because I got wonderful classmates, professors. We often hang out. We even went to Nobeyama uh, radio telescope in Nagano prefecture. Um, and here I am. So I strongly believe uh, what you like, you do well, no matter what. So keep doing, keep challenging, and there will be a way. <laughs> so this is what I believe in. Um, I left Okinawa after high school. I went to Sendai Miyagi Prefecture for my bachelor degree at Tohoku University. While I was an undergraduate student, I spent one year at University of California, Santa Cruz. And I was just so amazed by the opportunities in the US, the research, and also a graduate school provides basically tuition-free program, even to foreigner students like me. And so I decided to, to go to graduate schools in the US. I applied for several places and I decided to go to University of Hawaii and Manoa Institute for Astronomy because of their access to telescopes on Mauna Kea. After getting my master's and PhD, 
I went to Paris, France. Yes, that was my first job in France. Well, there's really, um, Paris is, you know, it's a known for uh, city of lights. Um, so it's not a good place to study stars from Paris, but they have telescope on Mauna Kea, Canada France Hawaii telescope. So I was using data from Canada France Hawaii telescope in Hawaii while I was in Paris. After Paris, I moved to move back to the States, this time Caltech, Pasadena uh, as a researcher. And then I also moved to <laughs> University of Chicago as a researcher. And nine years ago, I moved back to Hawaii as a uh, astronomer at Subaru Telescope. So this is my story. Um, here, I wanted to show you this video that my coworker took a few years ago. Uh, he took from our town Hilo. You see the telescopes on Mauna Kea and full moon moon is sinking. This is a real uh, actual video. He didn't use any computer graphics. Um, the moon looks big because of the contrast. Uh, he used the zoom lens from Hilo. So this is my town. I used to live in this condominium uh, in the center of this uh, video. Uh, this is Mauna Kea. You see Twin Keck telescopes and Subaru on the left. And there is a Kilauea volcano on the big island of Hawaii. And this is a Subaru telescope looking up the sky and you see lasers pointing at the sky, this is artificial, uh, we are creating artificial stars using this laser. This is called adaptive optics and we correct for atmospheric turbulence by using these laser stars. So we are creating artificial stars. So this is what's happening every night, every night on top of Mauna Kea. We are looking up the sky. Um, I wanted to show you this picture. This is a image picture taken by Cassini spacecraft. And in this picture of Saturn, there is the Earth, our planet Earth. Can you identify the Earth? Well, Earth is here. <laughs> it's very tiny. Okay, let's zoom in. This is our planet Earth. So in space, in the universe, Earth is quite small, tiny, and this is our planet. Um, I wanted to show you this famous quote by astronaut Alan Shepard. Um, if somebody had said before the flight, are you going to get carried away looking at the Earth from the moon? I would have said, no, no way. But yet, when I first looked back at the Earth standing on the moon, I cried. So I think this is an amazing perspective from the sky, from the space. And this is fundamental. When, I, when we talk about SDGs, sustainability, I think that thinking about our Earth planet, how precious, how rare, how amazing our planet is, is quite important. Um, this is another slide um, of the Earth. So our view of Earth from space changes how we see ourselves, the image we see in still all, all triggers empathy and the recognition of the interconnectedness of all creatures. So it makes us one, that's how I believe. There's no border in the space. <laughs> We're all humans on living on planet Earth. Um, astronomy is, in fact, uh, affected by climate change as well. Wildfire, uh, which actually recently happened in Arizona as well, is threatening observatories. Um, domes need to remain closed to protect mirrors from smoke damage. 
So astronomy nowadays also have to think about climate change and we have to proactively uh, work on climate change. Um, so some observatories are uh, putting solar panels next to the dome to get the energy from the sun. Um, also, one of the SDG's goal is education. So I wanted to briefly mention the education impact, uh, um, the COVID pandemic impact on education in Hawaii, um, as is uh, probably true for um, everywhere um, in the US and perhaps in Japan as well. Uh, the pandemic affected a student performance, academic performance pretty severely, especially in math and science in Hawaii, there is a very alarming uh, decrease in proficiency. For example, in math, 11% of deficiency and science, 9% of deficiency. Um, so together with Monarchy Observatories of Astronomers, we are uh, reaching out we are actually visiting local schools and we provide one-on-one -on -one individually tailored tutoring assistance. So this is what we are doing um, every day, actually, during this summer break, we go to local schools and teach students. Um, I think I am actually talking too much, so I should probably stop my talk soon, but I wanted to show you um, this slide before I end. Um, a lot of people ask me, so astronomy is wonderful, um, but is it useful in our daily life? Well, it actually is. The technology developed in astronomy is actually used in our daily life. For example, GPS satellite that we're using, for example, Google Map uh, is using satellites, um, astronomical knowledge, and also uh, in medicine, LASIK eye surgery, CT scan, MRI, these technologies are based on astronomy. And of course, wireless internet as well, it was developed in physics lab. So there are a lot of technologies developed in astronomy that is now used in our daily life. And uh, telescopes of Maui, Haleakala, is trying to find a near Earth object, killer asteroids. So yeah, so astronomy is also, uh, is, <laughs> can, is useful in our daily life. Okay, so I think I talked to too much. So I finished my uh, presentation here. But if you have time, please check this YouTube channel. Uh, there is a live streaming from Mauna Kea. It's 24 seven. Uh, it's um, maintained by Asahi Shimbun. Uh, so you can Google and type Asahi Mauna Kea live and you can enjoy Mauna Kea star view every day from home. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kakato Sensei. Next, Ms. Dannenberg, the floor is yours, please. Hello, good um, evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I am going to try to share my slides. Hopefully they're up. Um, and um, so um, welcome to my Everest presentation. I always, um, <laughs> I always say that I give the most boring Everest presentations and people think that I'm joking, but I'm really, I'm really not. Um, I think that this um, mountain and speakers about it have been presented with so much drama. Um, and I sort of joke that, you know, there's not sort of the dramatic music on the, on the mountain as we're walking down. And I think, um, um, I do think of this mountain and, you know, the way that I climbed it in a very sort of practical manner. Um, and so, um, although, you know, it's like spoiler alert, I did actually make it to the summit. But other than that, um, I think that I was sort of a different person coming into Mount Everest and sort of an unlikely candidate to have this sort of title as the first Black woman to summit. Um, and so I think the way I think of everything around this mountain is also um, quite different. And so um, I'm also going to begin um, just a little bit about me. So um, my father is from um, a rural 
city in South Carolina, and um, my mother is Okinawan. Um, both of them were very poor and living in fairly extreme poverty. Sort of when you know, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay were summiting Everest for the first time. Um, neither of my parents had electricity. Um, they were both farm workers. My mother was working um, on sugarcane farms with her family. Um, again, they didn't actually own these farms. They were working on other people's farms. And my father was living with his grandmother in South Carolina and picking cotton to help um, support her. Um, and so when I was little, we actually, I was born in Okinawa and that's me and my cousins um, on the sugarcane farm. And so I actually lived on that farm. Um, and all of my memories of it are really, um, that's me by the way, on the uh, looking sort of off to the side, the, sh the shorter one, the, the one right in the middle is my sister. Um, really happy. We had a lot of fun sort of playing in the sugarcane fields. And I think even when I think back then, even though I, there wasn't sort of a traditional climbing, mountaineering, and certainly not in Okinawa, which is, you know, an island um, and a tropical one at that. Um, uh, there was still a lot of sort of adventuring, I think, for us. But then um, my dad actually did go to medical school and became a doctor. And we moved to a very, very flat suburb in the Midwest, um, where I sort of had a typical middle class upbringing riding horses, which is a big thing. Um, Kentucky is very close to Cincinnati, where, where we lived, um, played the traditional sports, volleyball, basketball. I ran track and cross country. I did theater, lots and lots of theater um, in high school and college. Um, and so generally was just kind of an indoorsy kid, very athletic, but again, not, not really outdoorsy. And um, it wasn't until um, I was um, off to college and I signed up for what was called the freshman outdoor program. And I just saw a pamphlet. I actually was trying to go into um, a, um, a kayaking, like a kayak backpacking program. But as it turns out, if you literally never camp or backpack or kayak, they don't want you in the kayaking program because it's a little dangerous. And so I was invited instead to join a hiking program, a backpacking program through the presidential range of New Hampshire. And um, I did, it didn't click. Um, it wasn't like, I am not one of these people who could say, oh yes, and then I fell in love with it. In fact, um, I never thought I was going to do it again. Um, I thought it was sort of this one thing I did this one time. Um, those, that, that very top photo was actually me um, in college. Um, that's me putting a, a, a wig on Tom Hanks actually. Um, and I was still the indoor theater kid. Um, and it wasn't actually until I was in um, Tokyo and um, decided to sign up for a rock climbing lesson. I don't know what I was thinking because I do um, speak Japanese, but not, um, you know, your life is going to depend on it, Japanese. And so um, learning rock climbing in Japanese was maybe a little bit um, too much of a combination of stressors, but um, that is actually how and where I learned to rock climb. Um, I walked into um, a Patagonia store and this tall, lanky guy, everyone called him Jack, that gave um, uh, rock climbing lessons. And that's really where it started. Um, and then I moved back to the US and um, this is a little bit where we sort of start going on, on the topic of the SDGs. Um, I'd actually heard about the receding glaciers on uh, Kilimanjaro and the snows in Kilimanjaro. And so I decided that I wanted to climb Kilimanjaro and that is me in a very fuzzy photo um, taken with a disposable camera um, before, the, before the glaciers disappeared. And in fact, the glaciers have receded considerably even since this photo was taken. Um, but really that was the motivation. I wasn't really out to climb big mountains. I just thought, oh, I wanna see, I wanna see a glacier before they're all gone. Um, but this, by this point, it really, um, the mountaineering really did stick. And so um, I sort of did more. And actually my best friend from high school, um, in high school in the Midwest, um, wanted to climb Mount Rainier. And so the two of us actually learned how to, to have our basic mountain um, uh, glacier travel skills in New Hampshire. And that is us with 
let me tell you, that is just too much gear to be on. That is too much gear from Mount Rainier. <laughs> I look at it now and I laugh at it, but that's the two of us. We flew out across the country and came to uh, climb Mount Rainier. Um, I was living in Connecticut at the time um, and she was uh, in New Hampshire still. And then it just kept going. It was um, rock climbing and ice climbing. And um, I just say then it was like a little more and a little more. And then next thing you know, I'm on the summit of Mount Everest. And it's maybe a little more complicated than that, but um, not that much more complicated. And so um, I think that, um, you know, I'm not a person who sort of, I'm very analytical and very sort of incremental in the way I do things. And I, I see this as sort of a small series of steps. and. Um, and I think I, I look at sort of so many things that are done incrementally. And then I look at the problem of the environment and I see, you know, something where the incrementalism is, is not going to do. Um, and this was long be before sort of the most recent years where they really started saying that this was in a crisis. Um, and I think that I really saw this in the mountains. And this is a photo of what's called Lewis Glacier. And I'm sure that if you took this photo, this is um, this photo is probably 15 years old. And I'm sure that if you saw it now, um, it would look quite different. Um, it's receded considerably. Um, it is the largest glacier on Mount Kenya. And um, there used to be about 18 glaciers on Mount Kenya, and there's only 10 now. And 90% of the mass of this glacier has actually receded um, since in the last about 80 years. And um, most of that right around the turn of the century. And I had a sort of funny, but also um, dismaying experience um, climbing Mount Kenya because we were actually following a guidebook that at the time was maybe about 10 years old. And so this was early 2000s and it was from the nineties. So it was, the book guidebook was before this sort of massive um, uh, loss of, of mass. And, the guidebook said to um, that the trail went along the edge of the glacier and to follow the edge of the glacier. And we were walking and it was like really hard. Like it was, it was obvious, like something was wrong. We were in the wrong place. We couldn't figure it out. It was really steep and messy. And um, then we sort of looked and we realized that um, we were in the wrong place because the glacier had actually receded, that the trail was actually probably about 10 or 15 feet away from us. And so um, in the time that that guidebook had been written, the glacier had receded so much that you, could, that, that you couldn't even really see the trail anymore from the edge of the glacier. Um, but it was so unexpected because at the time they wrote it, that was actually a reasonable way to describe the location of the trail. And it was shocking to see it you know, that, in that sort of drastic way. And I think we see this um, even on Mount Everest, um, uh, this is a photo that I took um, from another mountain, and uh, this is the summit on the left, and um, it's what they call the um, the ice fall. And if you look at it this way, you can see that it looks like you know um, a waterfall, like a waterfall and a river, um, which is why they call it the ice fall. And if you talk to the Sherpas, you know who are the older Sherpas, you know this trail actually moved. They used to be able to um, travel on um, what was the other side of the glacier along the sort of the, the sort of um, edge on the actual ice and it receded so much that it became very unstable and dangerous and they actually moved to the uh, completely to the opposite side so even if you were to sort of look at this photo from with this one I took about you know when I climbed Everest about 15 years ago, um, and now and 20 years ago, you would see a fairly significant decrease in um, in the mass of the glaciers. And, you know, this is sort of a, you know, an existential threat to, to the livelihoods of the people there. Um, this is me in the ice fall. Um, so you kind of get a sense of what it looks like. It's breaking up a lot. Um, and there's a couple of things that are also happening on the mountain, which is that this ice fall is becoming very unstable. Um, and I think you're hearing more and more about um, tragic accidents that are the result of really, um, of uh, um, what they call seracs collapsing in the ice fall. Um, so this is a photo of a serac. Um, this is kind of a large, you know, ice tower. And there's, um, uh, his name is Dan, who's in front of it. Um, 
And this is, I'll just say that when you go under Cerax in normal climbing, you wouldn't normally uh, go very, very close underneath these, but um, these are actually set by uh, the, the local mountain, the, the park actually sets the trail. And so they set it rather close to the Cerax. And we were really nervous. I actually would run through this section because I was very nervous about running um, underneath these seracs, but they had been very stable. And so I think that there wasn't any sort of reason in their thinking to necessarily have it be far away from the seracs, which is normally in climbing, you wouldn't want to be this close to this. So what actually happened is I was actually with Dan, we were traveling together, but then I ran like I always do through this section. And so I ended up so far ahead of him, I was able to take this photo. Um, and not very long after I took this photo, um, less than a week, I think, actually, that Serac collapsed. And if you look kind of at this little peak here, this if you kind of see up here and see where the Serac is located, you can see kind of that same peak and you can see that the Serac should be here. And that's kind of the two photos on top of each other um, where the Serac used to be. Um, and this actually resulted in um, six Sherpas who were going up the mountain very early when it should be very stable um, um, and normally very safe getting um, caught in this um, ice avalanche basically and passed away. And it was um, an early tragedy. I think it's not one that made the news. Um, there were ones in the last um, maybe five years, 10 years that um, where Serax collapsed off of the the um, cliff. And those are the really the big ones that made the news. But I think even back here with this tragedy, um, we saw, you know, the beginning of um, a very unstable um, situation. And I do think um, this is a really difficult problem for the people living um, around the mountain. Um, um, you know, we talk a lot about Sherpas, but just um, if we're just um, so that everyone's on the same page, um, Sherpas, um, it's the name of actually the people who live at the base of the mountain. I think a lot of um, people use it interchangeably to mean like Porter, but um, it's not. It actually is um, the Sherpa people. It means Eastern people in Tibetan. Um, and all of their last names are Sherpa, actually. All of um, their they're traditionally named after the day of the week they were born. Um, and so there's like, there's sort of seven traditional names, first and last name, um, you know, um, so um, Pasang, and then they'll say Pasang Nudu, Pa Nudu, who is who I climbed with on the left. Um, but it does, and actually his Pasang's, Pa Nudu's um, wife's name is also Pasang Nudu, uh, but Pasang Serpa, and then their last names are all Sherpa. So, there's a lot of uh, descriptions when you're talking about people. It always has to be Pandudu Sherpa from, um, you know, X village, you know, who looks like this and who's that old and who's so-and-so's cousin. It's always this kind of lengthy description to narrow down who we're talking about. Um, but they are both porters as well as guides. They have, um, the Sherpas have uh, tea shops along the way for truckers. They run lodges. And so it is, you know, a big part of their economy, the um, Everest trekking and climbing. Because I think there's a lot of people who sort of take the attitude that maybe Westerners shouldn't go there. But it is very much like saying, you know, like saying, oh, well, you know, airplanes are polluting and so Boeing should just shut down without considering, you know, the impact on the economy and the local people. And certainly the Sherpas wouldn't want the Everest, um, the Everest business, while they do want it to be more responsible, they don't want it to go away completely. And I also think that they, that there's um, a not a, an um, equitable distribution of the money that is going to that mountain to the Sherpas, the local people versus everywhere else. But at the same time, um, they live there, their children live there, um, they have farms and grow their food there. And so um, the, the, pollution, the pollution that comes off the mountain and um, the, you know, the impacts of the receding glacier on the water and the changing in the environment um, really impacts them as well. So I think that with the Sherpas and with the people, you see this tension between 
um, you know, the sustainability and protection of the environment and protection of this beautiful natural resource and um, the economic needs of um, having their, their local economy completely dependent on um, people that are coming to this mountain. Um, there's very, there's, there's not maybe roads through here. Um, it's very mountainous, you know, that people walk through. And so there's not a lot of other um, options for, um, for, for economic development other than um, the tourism associated with the mountain. And so I do think, you know, it is something where when we think about, you know, mountains and climbers and tourism and the local people and the environment, um, you know, I think about these children, I think about, you know, what are they gonna grow up to be healthy, you know, be able to, you know, have a healthy environment as well as, you know, a, a a future with an education and you know economic um, advantages, and so um, it is a really interesting um, and I think difficult problem to be facing. And I think, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. I think that's my last slide. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, I like this slide. This is actually the um, puja. The um, <laughs> This is the ceremony where they're blessing um, us at the beginning, and I happened to look at what the um, monk was, he had this rice wine, and it was in this Nalgene bottle that he was carrying, and I looked at it, and it has this sticker on it that says, a fit woman is a powerful woman, <laughs> which I just thought was so funny, so um, I love this picture, um, and I always have to point out to the kids that that thing on the left is actually butter and uh, barley, it's not chocolate, so it's not, it's not as delicious as it looks, it's not sweet at all, um, but thank you, um, and yeah, open to questions. Thank you, speakers. Uh, now, we'd like to move to a question and answer session. Uh, while the audience members are using the chat and the Q&A functions to ask their questions, uh, I have a question for Dr. Kakazu. Uh, Dr. Kakazu, in your profession, you study celestial objects that are very far away from Earth. As an astronomer, do you and your colleagues have any specific action plans relative to the sustainable development goals? Yes, um, thank you for this excellent question. So we are trying to make observatories completely carbon neutral. It will take time. So we're, um, the National Science Foundation is actually trying to make at least one observatory completely carbon neutral in two years and use that observatory as a role model for others to follow. And also uh, we are trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and use renewable energy as much as possible. And that's why um, some observatories are now uh, using solar panels without using uh, traditional electricities. Um, we are also requiring what well, the, the, um, the policy is now is that uh, for new development, we. It, it, it will be likely to be required uh, for the climate impact. Uh, every time when we build a new major facility, we also, also have to uh, evaluate the impact uh, to the environment. And that's really important. Um, yeah, so I think there are a lot of uh, stuff are, are now being discussed in policy level, but in our daily life level as well, uh, we are trying to minimize waste. For example, we don't provide any plastic bottles. <laughs> we request people to bring their own bottles um, so that there will be uh, less waste. Yeah, so we are trying to do as much as we can. Thank you. Now I have a question for Ms. Stanenberg. Uh, Sophia Sen, uh, this is a question from the audience. What would you advise young people and policymakers about trekking and exploring? Where is the line between experiencing trekking and exploring and protecting the environment uh, through restricting access? Where is the line between the two? So I think it's a very difficult problem. I am actually a Washington State Parks Commissioner, and 
one thing that happened over the pandemic is a lot of people went to parks a lot more than we were used to because they were um, there, you know, other indoor activities were closed and a lot of people were new and didn't, weren't really experienced about, you know, staying on trails and garbage. And so I do think that there is a lot of education and I do think people should be free to explore. I'm not in favor of a lot of limitations um, because I, I, I do think it becomes exclusionary to new people who are getting involved and those new people have a tendency to be more people of color and lower income people. And so um, when we make things really exclusionary um, and limit the number of people, then um, we usually shut, that's who we shut out. But I do think that um, there needs to be a lot of education about leave no trace practices and um, you know how to recreate responsibly. I do think that people need to accept that maybe they're going to be a little bit more crowded. I think people want to be like out in the wilderness by themselves experiencing pristine wilderness, but if it's pristine, then you're actually impacting it. So I think that a lot of people need to accept that you might be in, you know, near other people. If there's just more people there, you don't all get to have your huge space to yourself. And it's just going to be a different way of sort of enjoying the outdoor um, uh, environment. And then I also think there's actually for people to spread out. <laughs> um, I think there's places, people ask me all the time if I would go back to Everest, and I always say, no, why would I do that? I've been there once. And there's actually just amazing mountains that are not famous, even in Nepal that are, they have trails and they have um, established routes. They're not sort of, you know, there's ways to kind of not have everyone at the same place that I also think reduces the impact to like sort of go to these other established places. But I do think it's a complicated policy issue. I don't think there's a really simple solution. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from the audience, and uh, I will ask this question. It's a two-parter, maybe a three-parter, uh, but uh, let me ask the same question to both uh, uh, Dr. Kagazu and Ms. Dannenberg. And questions are, which SDGs are most important to you? And what prevents sustainable development? What is the biggest barrier to sustainability? And finally, how can we overcome the challenges of SDGs? So it's a kind of a long question, I'm sorry, but uh, Dr. Kokazo, would you start with uh, uh, answering this? Sure. So um, I'm a huge advocate of education. So to me, quality education is most important personally, because in order to do any kind of sustainability development, People have to be educated. I need to learn. I myself need to learn. So to me, education is most crucial. And this pandemic severely affected, impacted indigenous people, people of colors, people who live in poverty. So I think that uh, tackling these educational inequality is very crucial. And I think the lack of education or misinformation is preventing sustainable development efforts. That's how I feel. So I, that's why I focus and I put a lot of efforts on education uh, for myself and also for uh, children and students around me, including my own daughter. Thank you. Ms. Dannenberg, same question. Which SDGs are most important to you? Maybe you can list top three. And what prevents sustainable development? What is the barrier? And how can we overcome those challenges? So um, I don't know, for me, I mean, I look a lot at gender equality and uh, climate change, as I talked about, but probably one that I haven't talked about is the one that I work with the most in my in my day job, in my job, um, which is um, sustainable, or I guess it's actually called, I think it's responsible consumption and production. And um, to me, I mean, it's really important to me only because I think um, as people in the US and in sort of the Western world, it's one of, it's the one that we need to step up to do. <laughs> Let's put it that I think it is the one where 
um, we need to change the way that we produce and consume. We are the the largest consumer consumers disproportionately, um, and the way we produce and consume things is just simply not sustainable. So um, when I look at how I think that people that I know around me need to um, contribute to the goals, I looked, I think that's really the place. It's where um, my company has the most influence. It's where my friends and colleagues do. Um, and it is, you know, I hate to call them sacrifices because I don't even think of it, but I do think of it as sort of sacrifices must be made. And they're not big sacrifices, but they make a big difference. I think the way that we consume and use plastics, I've been involved with the plastics treaty. And um, there's trade-offs, by the way, plastic is very light and has lots of positive environmental benefits for climate change because it doesn't take a lot of energy to transport it, but it really has to be managed in a very responsible way, especially at the end of life um, and then how it's disposed of. There's just so much with just saying consuming less, just consuming less. Um, and I think that if everyone on the Western world did that, we can make a big individual contribution. And like I said, in terms of corporations producing differently. Thank you. And I have another question from the audience and uh, I will ask both of you the same question. SDGs and their goals rely on cooperation between many different governments. Do you think it's realistic that we can rely on governments to drive change in a timely and equitable manner? Or will NGO, non-government organizations and market drivers should drive change faster? Uh, Dr. Kakazu, uh, could you answer that first? Well, I think everybody has to work on it. That's how I think. Um, sure, it's great government is not trying to work together, um, but I think individual level um, companies, NGOs, and every one of us have to tackle this. Otherwise, you know, the, the impact is so severe that for our future generation, I think everybody has to work together. Thank you. And uh, uh, Sophia san, you are in this business. So, uh, what is your opinion on this? Same. I think that everyone has a part to play. I do think we are going to need governments to um, step up and participate in a significant way. I think. Um, corporations can do a lot in a voluntary way. NGOs and activists can really um, push, but in the end, the government um, has the ability to um, mandate change, basically. Um, ones that we don't even see through different, um, you know, energy efficiency goals or restricting certain materials or certain chemicals or, um, you know, being able to sort of make those big changes i think governments have you know have to have to be involved and so i do think though the cooperation is very very slow <laughs> i think um if you've ever i mean i have i participate in a lot of un meetings and it's so slow and it's so tedious and it's so incremental um but then suddenly you'll find that they'll just move very quickly forward i mean more faster than corporations are comfortable on certain um topics when I think when activists in particular and NGOs um, push them. And so I think there's a role for everybody to play in um, contributing to the solutions. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Kakasa. Are there any international collaboration programs related to SDG between Okinawa and the United States? Sure. So Okinawa and Hawaii made a partnership um, on clean energy. Uh, and sustainable uh, relationship, um, sustainable energy development 10 years ago, uh, over 10 years ago, 2010. And they are, we're collaborating uh, in terms of ocean thermal energy conversion, OTEC. So in Kona, Hawaii has OTEC facility and Kumejima in Okinawa also has OTEC thermal energy plant. So every year they have a workshop to discuss uh, OTEC thermal energy and sustainability in education. So uh, this kind of uh, collaboration is going really well. And now we are also trying to start coral reef restoration collaboration, uh, which uh, is 
quite successful in Okinawa uh, 30 years ago, a local fisherman started restoring coral reefs and it's very successful. And now people in Hawaii are researchers are interested in how Okinawa uh, were, how, how Okinawa was able to successfully restore coral reefs. So uh, the new collaboration partnership is now being formed between OIST, Okinawa Institute of Science Technology, University of Hawaii. Thank so you. there are lots of partnership collaboration. Uh, Sophia-san, do you have a message for us so that we can tell our friends and family how SDG can be incorporated as part of our everyday life? Do I have a message? I mean, I think you maybe have already said the message, which is that the SDGs can be incorporated as part of your everyday life. Um, I think that in the way that you make your consumption choices every day, um, it really does make a difference. Um, and then, you know, for younger people looking at, you know, again, how they move forward in careers, I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunity in the SDGs. It's a really interesting space, um, especially as I said, there's also, there's a lot. I'll just say that there's other ones that I could talk about that are really interesting. I happen to be um, in a union. I'm in, I, at Boeing, I'm in a union. So I've been very interested in a lot of the labor and the sort of fair work that's part of the SDGs, as well as, you know, as I said, the gender equality, um, sustainable economic development. I think that there's so much and so many different ways that people can get involved, but I think the way to make a difference sort of right now today is in your consumption, deciding your consumption choices. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, Kakazo-sensei, I'll ask you the same question. Do you have a message for us so that we can tell our friends and family how SDG can be incorporated as part of our everyday life? Well, I repeat the same thing as Sophia San said. I think that there are so many th things that we can actually do in daily life. Um, but at the same time, I want everybody to go outside, outdoor, enjoy nature. Because I think that at the end of the day, we, we love our planet Earth. We love our environment. I think this is really fundamental and that's so important for us. So, and because I'm an astronomer, I would everyone to look up the sky, you know, enjoy amazing stars. And if it's raining, you can always check YouTube. We have a monarchy live video 24 seven from several telescopes. So yeah, yeah. So feel the nature feels you know, we are part of this amazing um, universe. So that's my message. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful message. Uh, so we have reached the time uh, limit. So we will wrap up this conversation. And uh, speakers, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, thoughtful answers to our questions and answers. Uh, I will turn over the panel to uh, uh, our event chairperson, uh, Makiko Caulfield. Makiko san, dodo. Thank you so much to our guest speakers, Sofia san and Yuko san, for taking the time to speak for us today. The information and discussion you shared are all very informative, and it was a valuable opportunity for us to hear inspiring personal stories from such distinguished environmentalists. I'm personally more motivated to take a part of these important topics for planet and future generation. And all of you who attended today's event, thank you for joining us and being a part of this valuable and interesting discussion. Our joint program with OIST will continue for the term of 2022 to 23, so we can continue to learn about SDG and also programs, research, and projects focus on nature, the environment, and climate through speakers from OIST. Also, our committee has started planning that reviewing tour in 2024 to visit OIST in Okinawa, Japan as a special fundraising event. So please stay tuned for more details at a later time. Again, thank you so much for joining. I'll see you at the next event. Have a great evening. <laughs>